Hello everyone! The other day Blizzard announced a brand new hero for Heroes of the Storm, namely Kilfa Sunstrider. So I figured it'd be a good idea to take a look at his story, and considering that most of you voted for him, this should be a lot of fun. Kilfus has quite a big story behind him, so I might not be able to tell all the little details, and I'll probably do it in two parts. But let's just begin and see how far we can go, shall we? Not much is known about Kilfus' youth. Jaina says that he once was a student at Dalaran, and he was the son of Anisterian Sunstrider, the king of the High Elves. In the past, the High Elves, they used to be high-born Night Elves, who fought in the war against the Burning Legion. This war took place around 10,000 years ago, in which Queen Azara, she tried to summon Sargeras and the Legion into the world. Some of the highborn did not agree with their queen's choices, they deflected from her, and they joined the Night Elf resistance. Eventually, at the end of the war, Azara and the Legion were defeated, and some of the highborn that stayed at the queen's side, they were turned into the Naga as the world of Kalimdor sundered apart. The Highborn that joined the Night Elves, they were led by Dathomir Sunstrider, and they would eventually be exiled by the rest of the Night Elves. The Night Elves had made the use of arcane magic punishable by death. Considering that they didn't want another Legion invasion, they didn't want to draw the attention, so they made the use of arcane magic punishable. Illidan Stormrage had turned a big fountain of water, water that was so critical at this time. He had used a vial from the Well of Eternity, several vials even. He had created a new Well of Eternity, and for these actions they imprisoned him because Malfurion, he convinced all the other Night Elves to not execute his brother, so instead they imprisoned him for life. Now the rest of the Highborn, they were unable and unwilling to give her the birthright of the use of arcane magic. Instead of killing all of them, the Night Elves decided to exile the Highborn, but before the Highborn left, they took with them one of Illidan's vials. This vial was filled with water from the original Well of Eternity, they took it with them, and during their travels, the Highborn, they would eventually change, not only in appearance, but they also changed in behavior. And eventually, they would call themselves High Elves. They built the kingdom of Quelphalus, they used the vial of water to create their sun well, and with the use of magic, they created their own beautiful kingdom. A kingdom that would last for millennia, was able to hold out against the trolls, became allies with the humans, and eventually the High Elves, they would be ruled by Dathomir's great-grandson and Kilfas' father, namely Anisterian Sunstrider. Like I said, there isn't much known about Kilfas' youth, so I wanted to take the opportunity to explain a little bit about the history of the High Elves, because it's very important for the rest of Kilfas' story. The first time that we see Kilfas pop up in the story is when Ketgar informs the Council of Six about the events that took place during his time as apprentice to the Guardian Medivh. Medivh, under the influence of Sargeras, he had opened the Dark Portal and initiated the first Orcish Horde invasion. Ketgar eventually figured out that it was his mentor who had led the Orcs into Azeroth, and together with Corona and Edwin Lothar, they managed to take out the Corrupted Guardian and stop Sargeras' his plans. This did not prevent the Orcs from invading their world though, events were already set in motion, and Stormwind's King was assassinated and the city of Stormwind fell. Those that were able, they fled the city, they set sail to the lands of Lordaeron to warn them about the threat of the Horde and get an army ready. As Ketgar was summoned before the Council, he was getting ready to make his report, but as was procedure with the Council of Six, the Council had cloaked themselves to keep their true identity a secret. Ketgar at this point had been through far too much, he'd stayed up far too late talking tactics with Lothar, so he didn't want to play such games. He asked them all to remove their cloaks so they could talk face to face, and although some were shocked by this request, Kilfa Sunstrider, he simply chuckled and was the first to remove Remove his disguise. Now, for those unaware, the Council of Six is the name given to the Kirin Tor High Council of Dalaran. These six leaders, they're the leaders of both the city and all the territories under the control of Dalaran. And besides Kilfa Sunstrider at the time, you also had Antonidas, Kelfuzad, Cressus. Modera, and I assume and Serum Runeweaver, although the book simply describes him as a pudgy man, which Ketgar didn't recognize, but if I looked at the list of possible members, he's most likely the one. Ketgar made his report to the council, he explained about Medivh, he explained about the orcs, Corona, the fall of Stormwind, all the information was given to them, and the council decided that the best course of action was to make the destruction of the Dark Portal their number one priority. Throughout the rest of the war against the Horde, the Kirin did offer their aid with their Magi, and it was Ketgar who shut
shut down the portal after the first horde was defeated. He was unable to completely destroy the connection between Draenor and Azeroth, though that connection would remain, and the horde would eventually return for their second invasion. This time, the horde didn't come to conquer the planet. That plan already failed, they had new ambitions. This time, all they wanted to do was collect three artifacts, namely the Book of Medivh, the Scepter of Sargeras, and the Eye of Dalaran. The final artifact, as the name suggests, the Eye of Dalaran, it was kept at Dalaran under magical protection. As the Death Knight Terangor and his troops broke in, alarms were raised, and as Kilfus joined the fight, he saw his close friend Sephara die in battle. In retaliation, Kilfus raised both hands and drew them apart. Across the room, one of the Death Knights jerked and then shrieked as his body was literally torn limb from limb. And tonight has warned Kilfus that the Death Knights had to be stopped from teleporting, so the prince did his best to stop them, he tried to weave a spell, but they managed to escape moments before he was finished. The Death Knights didn't teleport far away though, and with a spell of their own, they were able to follow their teleportation. Up on the balcony, this time they managed to cast their spells, they managed to prevent the Death Knights from teleporting further away, but unfortunately, that was not enough. The Horde had the Black Dragon Deathwing working with them, and he appeared alongside the balcony and carried them away. At this point, the risk of shooting spells and angering the mighty Black Dragon, it was simply too great. The Deathwing could turn around, incinerate their city, so Kilfus and the others, they let them go. Thankfully, the Alliance of Lordaeron, amongst them Khadgar himself, they were able to figure out the Horde's plans and they stepped through the Dark Portal to stop them. Kilfus stayed behind and resumed his duties as member of the Council of Six, while his attention was drawn to completely different matters. A young girl named Jaina Proudmore, she'd moved to Dalaran to study the arts of magic as an apprentice of Antonidas. Kilfus was very interested in a young mage and he openly courted her. He had even invited her to come and visit him in Quelphalus, a land where magic was part of the culture, not just part of a city, not just confined to a handful of elite educated magi. Magic is the birthright of every citizen who would embrace the sun well, and Jaina, she was more than welcome to come and experience it. Unfortunately for the High Elf Prince, Jaina had already set her eyes on another prince, and she also found Kilfus to be more intimidating than someone she could actually fall for. She felt no such intimidation with Prince Arthas Menifil, and the human prince felt the same for her. One day after the snowball fight, they ended up in each other's arms and they kissed for the first time. From that moment on, they would steal moments here and there to sneak a kiss, to sneak a hug, since openly loving each other, it would just feed the rumor mill, and both of them had silently decided to not let these rumors grow. As Jaina came back from practicing her fire spells one day, Arthas was waiting for her and he dragged her into the shadows for a loving embrace. What they didn't know was that right behind her, Kilfus had followed Jaina to bring back the tome that she had dropped and as he caught them in their acts, he was furious. Anger and outrage fairly crackled around the mage. He was powerful and Arthas knew that if it came to it, he wouldn't stand a chance. Kilfus kept his composure though and with clenched fist he hissed, ashamed of her. Are you Arthas? Is she only worth your time and attention if no one knows about her? Arthas's eyes narrowed. I have fought to avoid the ravagers of the rumor mill, he said quietly. You know how these things work, Kill, don't you? Someone says something, and next thing you know, it's believed to be true. I would protect her reputation by... Protect! Kilfus barked the words. If you cared about her, you would court her openly, proudly. Any man would. He looked at Jaina, and the anger was gone, replaced by a fleeting expression of pain. Then that too disappeared, and Jaina looked down. I will leave you two to your trysts, and do not fear. I will say nothing. Kilfus kept his word, and he said nothing, and the love between Jaina and Arthas grew stronger. Until the point came that Arthas got cold feet. He wasn't ready for the responsibilities of it all, he wasn't ready for children, the weight of the crown, all of that, and he decided to end their relationship. Losing Jaina would only be the first thing that Kilfus would lose to Arthas, since this brings us to the events of Warcraft 3. A plague was spreading across the lands of Lordaeron, and Prince Arthas, together with Jaina, were sent to investigate. They found out that the plague was being spread through the grain used to feed the people, and the man behind it all was none other than Kelfuzad, former member of the Council of Six, but exiled from Dalaran and even Lordaeron because of his dark studies into necromancy. Kelfuz had been there that day when Antonidas informed Kelfuzad about what they knew about his studies, but Kelfuzad didn't care. At this point, he was listening to the 
Whispers of Ner'zhul of the Lich King himself, sent by Kill Jaden to weaken the world of Azeroth and get it ready for another invasion from the Burning Legion. Eventually Arthas and his troops, they managed to take out Kel'Thuzad. He decided to purge Treff home since the grain had already been given out to the people and there Morganist haunted the prince to follow him to Northrend and deal with him there. Arthas did just that. He went to Northrend, he picked up the Cursed Blade of Frostmourne, gave up a piece of his soul and he got his revenge. After spending time in the cold heart of Northrend, listening to the whispers of Ner'zhul, he was now an agent of the Lich King and as he returned home, he murdered his own father and he slaughtered the people of his kingdom. This was just the first step in the plan though. Next, they would have to summon Archimond into the world and Kel'Thuzad was the man for the job. This did require to collect Kel'Thuzad's decomposed remains. They had to carry these remains in the urn that contained Arthas' father's ashes and they had to travel to the High Elven Kingdom of Quel'Thalas. Only the powers of the Sunwell would be strong enough to bring back the Necromancer. Ah, the wondrous, eternal Quel'Thalas. I haven't been here since I was a boy. Be wary. The elves likely wait in ambush. The frail elves do not concern me, Necromancer. Our forces are strengthened with every foe we slay. Don't be too overconfident, Death Knight. The elves must not be taken lightly. We shall see. Bring forth the prisoner. Where is the entrance to your land, elf? You will never enter Quel'Thalas, Fallen Prince. The woods themselves protect our borders, and the enchanted elf gates protect our capital. Your precious gates will not stop me any more than these trees, little elf. Bring up the meat wagons. We'll make our own entrance. Kilfus wasn't home when the undead marched into his lands, marched upon his city and his people. But Quel'Thalas was not without its own defenses. The city had been able to hold out against the trolls, they were able to hold out against the dragons under the control of the orcs, so their magical protection was strong, yet it wasn't enough. A traitor from within, Darkan Drafir, informed Arthas about how to disable the magical protection. Three magical stones Arthas had to collect, and these stones, the location where they were hidden, they were kept a secret of course, and only those on the inside knew about them, yet Arthas was informed and the defenses quickly fell. People like Sylvanas Windrunner tried to stand up against the fallen prince, Lady Lidrin, all of their people, they put up a fierce fight, but death itself had come to their home and it was not about to stop. At Queldenas, King Anastarian Sunstrider rode out to meet Arthas and Frostmourne head on. The king was a powerful sorcerer, but three millennia rested upon his shoulders. Despite that, despite the obvious disadvantage, he still met Arthas and he fought with the ancient weapon known as Fellow Malorn, also known as Flamestrike. Sylvanas is a banshee, she was forced to witness the battle and she knew that the ancient elven weapon was no match for Frostmourne. It snapped as the blades clashed, the severed pieces whirling away and Anastarian fell, his soul ripped from him and consumed by the glowing Frostmourne. Arthas' mission was successful and the powers of the Sunwell were claimed. Citizens of Silvermoon, I have given you ample opportunities to surrender, but you have stubbornly refused. Know that today, your entire race and your ancient heritage will end. Death itself has come to claim the high home of the elves. Now arise, Kel'Thuzad, and serve the Lich King once again. I am reborn as promised. The Lich King has granted me eternal life. News of the destruction quickly reached Kilfas in Dalaran. Jaina tried to talk to him, speak words of compassion and comfort, but Kilfas was furious. He was barely restraining himself from physically harming her, and he accused her of letting this butcher sleep in her bed and choosing Arthas over him. Jaina understood that he was attacking her since his real enemy wasn't there, yet she could do nothing to comfort him. I could have stopped him. I should have. He straightened and coldness suddenly chased away the fire in him. He bowed low, exaggeratedly. I will be departing Dalaran as soon as possible. There is nothing for me here. Jaina winced at the emptiness, the resignation in his voice. I was a fool of the greatest order to ever think 
any of you humans could aid me. I will leave this place of doddering old magi and ambitious young ones. None of you can help me. My people need me to lead now that my father... He fell silent and swallowed hard. I must go to them, to what pathetically few remain. To those who have endured, rebirthed by the blood of those who now serve your beloveds. Kilfoss could have teleported instantly home, but instead he decided to travel so he could witness the devastation. Upon arriving, his people wanted answers from their prince. They were hungry, tired, devastated, yet the prince did not immediately address them. He first asked Lord from Arvaran to show him to his father so he could pay his respects. The prince began with a blessing. I knew this day would come, but I never dreamed it would come so soon. I fear I am not ready, father. You are the king. You will always be the king. There was a sound of cloth rubbing, and though he could not see it, Lorfmar imagined the prince kneeling at his father's side. I only ever wanted to make you proud. Grant me the strength to be the man you hoped I would be. Grant me the strength to carry us through this time of despair. Grant me the strength now to lead our people through. The prince offered a final prayer. After that, the prince and his magi, they inspected the sun well, and they came to a horrible conclusion. The resurrection of Kelfuzad had corrupted the magical energies, and if they did not do something, then the corruption would not only spread through the lands, it would spread through their own people. Even though the sun well was their birthright, their fountain of power, it had to be destroyed. Some of the high elves, they protested of course, but eventually they realized that it had to be done. On top of that, Leodrin informed them all that trolls were gathering, and they were getting ready for an attack. They too wanted to claim the Sunwell's power, so Kilfas decided that they would deal with the corruption, with the remaining undead and all the assaulting trolls in one single strike. As Liadrin, Lorfamar and several others kept the enemies at bay, Kilfas, Romaf and Alastor, they worked on their spell. Each of them held one piece of the Key of Free Moons, the same key that Arthas used to break the defenses, and it was recovered after Arthas was done with it. Romaf, Kilfas and Astalor, they backpedaled as the pulsating pillar of blinding white engulfed the violent use of the Sunwell. It radiated outward with a loud hum that muted all other sounds. With one final push it pulsed, then snapped back to the Sunwell center. The hum was replaced with a sudden silence, broken only by the sound of rain hammering the earth. Now, now, Kilfa screamed, stretching his arms wide. One by one, the far striders, the healers, and finally the magisters and Kilfa's himself, they disappeared as the blinding white beam exploded outwards, vaporizing everything and everyone in its path. And when it dissipated, it let nothing of the sun well but a dark and empty hole. The High Elves made the impossible choice of blowing up the Sunwell to prevent the corruption from spreading. Not all of its powers were gone though. The Red Dragon Coriastras, he collected the remaining powers as he knew that sooner or later someone would realize the same that these powers were there and come looking for them. He hid the powers away by disguising it as a young girl named Envina Teague. But that's a bit of a side story that I'll cover next week. And on top of that, I already did a video specifically for Envina Teague. Now for Kilfus, it was time to take his father's place and lead his people. The moon crystals used in their spell they had endured, but their power was greatly diminished and corrupted by the energies they have channeled. They decided that Prince Kilfus would be the best man to keep them safe, so Kilfus kept the three orbs. Two on his shoulders and one above his head. The prince was now leader of their people, but he would not name himself king. His father would be the last king of the High Elves. They would now call themselves Blood Elves in honor of those who had laid down their lives to defend their way of life, to defend their home and their people. These Blood Elves would find out that being dependent for millennia on a source of power on the Sunwell, it left a certain hunger behind. They were addicted to magic, so would have to find a way to cope to survive, to rebuild, to prevail. Strangely, we found deliverance in the demon Illidan. That story, however, I'll save for next week, since there are still many events to talk about and have been going on for long enough. Next week, we'll take a look at how Kilfus takes up the role as leader of his people and the choice he had to make to assure a future for all of them. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the story so far. Subscribe if you like my videos. And until next time, guys, see ya! My people lost everything. Their light was extinguished, replaced by a hunger for magic and vengeance.
we became the Blood Elves. Now, I will fight for my homeland.